team. Now, these were the expert witnesses for the defendants. William Dembski, of course, Michael Behe, William Dembski, Warren Nord, who is an ID sympathizer at UNC Chapel Hill. I'm not quite sure what he does. It has something to do with education or something and religion. Dick Carpenter, who had worked for Focus on the Family, was to be their counterpart to Brian Alters, their science education expert. John Angus Campbell, who teaches rhetoric at University of Memphis. Stephen Meyer from the Discovery Institute. Steve Fuller, an American who teaches sociology at um, University of Warwick in England. And Scott Minnick, who teaches uh, molecular biology at the University of Idaho. Well, Dembski was due to be deposed on June 13. Dembski backed out just a few days before he was to be deposed. Um, and um, so did Stephen Meyer. So did John Angus Campbell. They wanted their own attorneys. They had heard all of the major expert witnesses um, deposition. They knew what we would say. They had our reports. They knew exactly what we would say. They wanted to be represented by their own independent attorneys. The Thomas More Law Center said no, and, they, and so they backed out. And I think they, they were really fearful of being cross-examined. After they heard the testimony, the deposition testimony, they did not want to be on the witness stand. And so uh, Warren Nord was withdrawn without explanation, didn't get to testify, so was Dick Carpenter. So that left only these three people. Behe, Steve Fuller, and Scott Minnick were the only expert witnesses the defense had. And they were the best expert witnesses we could have had. They helped us enormously. <laughs> Especially when... Um, Eric Rothschild got Behe to admit that under Behe's definition of scientific theory, astrology would also qualify, along with intelligent design. It was a, one of those sort of MasterCard moments, priceless. <laughs> um, so my tasks were to, uh, we really had to educate the judge. Uh, he had had our expert witness reports and all of that, but we had to go to court and literally um, walk him through the case. So my job was to, to show him the wedge strategy, explain that intelligent design, establish for him that intelligent design is both religious, uh, and, um, a religious movement and is creationism, and also to discuss pandas, uh, the, the textbook. That was, those were my two major tasks. And so what I did, I literally walked him. We had a big projection screen. This judge was, was known not to like technology in his courtroom too much, but he's now, I think, very, very glad that, that we, ha we did this. He let us do it. And we had a projection screen. And I literally walked him through the document. I showed him, for example, the opening statement. The proposition that human beings are created in the image of God is one of the bedrock principles on which Western civilization was built. You can see right there that this the intelligent design movement thinks of itself. This was an internal document that was going to be used for fundraising, just going to go out to potential donors. They are describing their movement to their own potential donors, to their supporters. So they, it shows us that they view this as a religious, a religious effort. It's grounded in religion. Also, I showed him that one of the, uh, the, the, the steps that they would take to carry out the phases of their strategy was to, to use apologetics seminars to spread the word about intelligent design. And apologetics is, you probably know, it, it's, it's, it's the defense of Christianity against attacks. Um, and so they were going, this is a very, very overtly religious uh, concept that they were using to explain how they planned to promote intelligent design. And so I showed all that to the judge. I showed him this quote from Dembski uh, from 1999 in which he defines, he defines intelligent design. Well, to the public, they say it's a cutting-edge new scientific theory. But when they're speaking to their own followers, they talk very candidly. And he defined intelligent design as the logos theology of John's gospel, restated in the idiom of information theory, which makes intelligent design not just religious, but Christian. It's a sectarian Christian concept. It's founded not on the book of Genesis, because they don't want to fight with the young earthers about the age of the earth. They moved it over to the first book of John. It's a very minimalist account of uh, the Logos creating the world. The Logos is Jesus Christ, by the way. And Johnson, Philip Johnson, defines intelligent design as theistic realism. Mere creation, the defining concept of the movement. This means that we affirm that God is objectively real as creator, and that his handiwork can be empirically detected in biology. I told this to the judge. I also gave him another just priceless moment. I was sitting in the law office one day, um, and Eric told me to entertain myself 
while he went and did the type of law that pays his bills for a little while. And so I was reading a copy of Touchstone magazine. It was a fifth anniversary issue. They had done a special issue. Touchstone is a Christian magazine. They had done a 1999 special issue on ID, and they were doing a 2004 anniversary issue, and they interviewed most of the major people in the movement. And Paul Nelson, who was a young earth creationist, he's the liaison into the young earth community, was asked what was the biggest challenge facing the intelligent design movement. Now keep in mind, this is 12 years after the wedge strategy is, is formally, it is implemented in 1992. He says the biggest challenge is getting a theory. We don't have such a theory right now, and that's a real problem. Um, without a theory, it's very hard to know how to focus, where to direct your research. Right now we've got a bag of powerful intuitions. Now these intuitions he's talking about are the two central planks in the scientific platform of intelligent design. Um, a handful of notions such as irreducible complexity, that's Michael Behe's signature contribution, and specified complexity, which is Dembski's. But he said, as yet, we've got no general theory of biological design. So I'm sitting in, in this big conference room in the great big uh, Pepper Hamilton building thinking to myself, now isn't this special? Uh, you know, I just could not believe my good luck. I finally got a chance to read that for the first time. They're waiting for Eric. Um, and so we, I communicated this little piece to the judge. Um, I also showed him that they described themselves as creationists back in 1995 when they were really before the Center for Science and Culture was started. Uh, they had had a conference, their first conference was at Southern Methodist University in 92. Um, and Mark Hartwig, uh, focused on the family employee who was also working with them with the Discovery Institute, um, wrote an article from Moody Magazine, it was a, a Baptist magazine, calling um, Dembski et al. Uh, a, young, a, a breed of uh, young ev evangelical scholars, uh, like Stephen Meyer you see at the bottom. And he referred to them as creationists, creationists and evolutionists. They had uh, Michael Ruse was there, I think, and they had some other scientists there to, to, to get a platform with these people. Um, and he referred to the ID people as creationists, and so I communicated this to the judge uh, this, this is why it's very helpful to have a library with the good archives, which we have at NCSE, like you have a library here, because this information was in our archives. Um, and I had uh, made a chart for Eric to use, and we used part of this in, co in court. That this is, it's on my website at www.creationismstrojanhorse.com. It's a little document I made uh, from, from, uh, from Creation Science to Intelligent Design, showing how an Intelligent design comes directly out of earlier creationism using quotes from Henry Morris in the 1970s through the 1980s into intelligent design in, in the 80s and the 90s, showing that they're, they're doing exactly the same thing, uh, except for the young earth part. And so we used part of that, several parts of that chart. This is just one part. You see Henry Morris saying that evolution is, is not a fact. It's, it's a, neither a fact or a theory nor a hypothesis. And then you have... You have uh, Mark Hartwig and Stephen Meyer in Of Pandas and People saying the same thing, that evolution only in the most trivial sense could it be considered a fact. And, and there are many, many, many examples just like this, and we used several of them in court. So this is the type of evidence that I presented to the judge. Um, and remember Dean Kenyon, who was the co-author of Pandas? Okay, he really was, has been a very quiet, low-profile figure in this movement, but he turned out to be one of the central people in, in my testimony as co-author of Pandas, but also as the person in whom you can literally see the creation science movement morph into the intelligent design movement. In 1980, he was in trouble at San Francisco State University because he was teaching creationism to his freshman biology students. And so there's a, an article from the Lexington Leader, Kentucky, um, on December 18, 1980. He was a creation scientist consciously so. He filed uh, a sworn affidavit as a creation scientist in 1984 um, in the Edwards versus Aguillard case. And in his sworn affidavit, he speaks as a creation scientist when he says that uh, it's based on my, it's my professional opinion that creation science is just as scientific as evolution. This is in 84. And of course, this case produced the Edwards versus Aguillard ruling, Supreme Court ruling in 1987, outlawing the balanced treatment of evolution by teaching creation science. So he was functioning as a creation scientist, self-described creation scientist. He was co-author. While he was working on this very case, he was helping to write pandas, which is one of the things I discovered in the subpoena documents. Documents were subpoenaed from the Foundation for Thought and Ethics that is, holds the copyright to pandas. And I found a letter they had written in 86. He was working on 
the edwards case and writing pandas at the same time